Okay, guys, let's do a few headlines. <clears throat> Actually, I had thought about talking about talking about this uh, and about bringing this up, um, but I hadn't really gotten any clear direction to do so. Um, like everyone else, I'm I'm struggling for um, struggling for inspiration to do videos. Uh, but David Benjamin had sent me an email. I'm just now getting the emails, guys. Like I'm I'm going through them right now. Um, David Benjamin has sent me a link to this Yahoo Finance, uh, and he uh, was reminded about what Daniel 8 had said. We're going to go look at that. Um, and, uh, and this was my confirmation to cover this. And I've got several stories to look at from several different sources uh, about what's happening right now uh, as it involves Trump and, and our government. Um, there's some things going on behind the scenes that most people, are, I don't think, are quite aware of. First, let's go into Daniel. Because there's two things I need to point out. Um, and, and one of them is a reminder about Bible prophecy and how we read Bible prophecy. So, uh, in Daniel's vision, in Daniel 8, and if you've been with me for a month or more, you know about this. I've done several videos on this. When I read it, I immediately was reminded of something different. And it talks about, he saw in a vision, and so it happened while I was looking, that I was in Shushan, the citadel. That's in Iraq. And I, and in the video I did a couple months ago, I showed uh, on a map where that was. Still there. Which is in the province of Elam, and I saw in the vision that I was by the river Gulai. Then I lifted my eyes and saw, and there standing beside the river was a ram with two horns. And the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. <clears throat> this is an indicator of leaders because um, it says it's media Persia further down we'll get to that um, and when you look media what media in Persia is that's uh, Turkey Syria and Iran mainly Turkey and Iran um, uh, Turkey is also referred to as Asia Minor but that it's that region right there so it's, it's, we're looking at the leaders of this time, of, of these two nations. In verse 4 it says, I saw the ram pushing westward, northward, and southward, so that no animal could withstand him, nor was there any that could deliver from his hand. But he did according to his will and became great. Uh, so now we see what's going on as he's trying to conquer, trying to overtake other regions. And as I was considering, suddenly a male goat, now here's where it gets interesting. A male goat came from the west, across the surface of the whole earth, Without touching the ground. Sorry. You couldn't hear that, but I've got volcano verse uh, going in the background, and it's giving uh, earthquake updates and volcanic eruption updates. <clears throat> Mount Fuego was going off last night. So he was across the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Now, typically, when you look at uh, the representation of what goats are in the Bible, it's referring to um, a lesser animal, a, a lesser creature. <clears throat> I'm not coming to get you. Either come in here and sit down or go back in there. Come on. This chihuahua is so weird. She's afraid to walk across the floor, but if I put a cat in the middle of the floor, she'd be all kinds of going after it. Weird dog. Anyway, um, a goat is usually referred to as the lesser animal. Um, and that's what typically they use to refer to uh, other nations that are less than Israel. Uh, goats and rams and stuff like that. So when we see that type of, of typology, that type of reference, it kind of gives us an idea of what this is. This goat is some other nation that, that isn't Israel. Uh, it's just a representation. And he came across the whole earth without touching the ground. Now if you think about what this could be referring to, because at this point reading Daniel 8, you don't really know what it's referring to. Later on, these two angels explain it. But at this point, if you're thinking about our time now, which you'll see in a minute, because we're going to cover the chapter, <clears throat> um, that's an airstrike. 
across the whole earth without touching the ground. That's an airstrike. And he has a notable horn between his eyes. That indicates one leader. Then he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing beside the river, and ran at him with furious power. It's an attack. And I saw him confronting the ram. He was moved with rage against him, attacked the ram, and broke his two horns, took out those two leaders. There was no power in the ram to withstand him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled him. And there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. Therefore the male goat grew very great. But when he became strong, the large horn was broken, and in place of it, four notable ones came up toward the four winds of heaven. Now it's interesting to note, and I'm going to make this statement about Bible prophecy, and it's super easy to do, it is to read Bible prophecy and to see it, and we're all guilty of it, to see it as this grand event that everybody's going to witness, and it's going to be right there on the world stage. It's not always the case. In a lot of cases, Bible prophecy, it, it reads like it's a grand event, but it can actually be an extremely subtle event. And you might barely see it happen. Now go back up here and look at what he did, he had the, how he attacked this ram and wiped him out, came across the whole earth not touching the ground. Well, maybe he came across the whole earth without touching the ground because it was a political attack. When I read that, I, I immediately, in the first time I read it, I immediately thought airstrike. But this could be even a political attack. And attacked him so violently that it took out the two leaders and caused the country to fail and fall. That's how Bible prophecy works. There's times where Bible prophecy, certain parts will start getting fulfilled, and you won't see until after it's been fulfilled. And you're like, oh, that's what that meant. you know. Um, and there's all kinds of prophecies you can go back to uh, that will show you that, like when Israel became a nation in a day. Um, <coughs> then the goat grew, grew very great, but when he became strong, the large horn was broken, and in place of it, four notable ones came up toward the four winds of heaven. Now, the first time I read this, I thought, hmm, that's interesting. Does that mean that notable horn comes down, and then that nation will break apart and four others will come up? Most likely. And out of one of them came a little horn which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. And it grew up to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. We know exactly who that is. That's, that's the Antichrist. That's Satan. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host. And by him, the daily sacrifices were taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Now this has a lot of meaning too. When you look at Bible prophecy and you think about all the different things that these key words refer to, it makes you think of this, 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 and then you're trying to figure out which one it is. Now daily sacrifices can be that they've reinstituted the animal sacrifices in Israel and he's going to take those away. It can also refer to daily prayer. They can change it and make it, because they're supposed to come up with this beast law, this Sunday law, where there's no worship during the week, there's only worship on one day, and that's it. That way everything else stays normal, nobody gets offended, but there's one day for everybody to do all their worshiping on. That's what that could be referring to. Because when you read in the Bible, uh, prayer is a, is a sacrifice. It's an it's a acceptable sacrifice to the Lord. It ta talks about that in a bunch of scriptures. So if that's the case, and that's what that is, we could be seeing this happening right now in our lifetime. Let's read a little further. Because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices. And he cast truth down to the ground. He did all this and prospered. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the certain one who was speaking, how long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation? What is that? The abomination of desolation? The giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot. We hear about that in the book of Revelation. In chapter 12? No. 14. Something like that. And he said to me, For 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Very, very interesting vision he's having here. Now we get the interpretation of the vision. And I'm just going to run through this because a lot of people are new to the channel and haven't heard this yet. Uh, but I'll do a more in-depth one later. 
Then it happened, when I, Daniel, had seen the vision as was seeking the meaning, as suddenly there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And, and there's symbology in all this stuff. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Ulai, and called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell on my face. But he said to me, understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. So that would be the end, the tribulation time. Now, as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep with my face to the ground. But he touched me and stood me upright. And he said, Look, I am making known to you what will happen in the latter time of the indignation, for at the appointed time the end shall be. So we know this is about the, the tribulation. We have a, a, There's a set time for this to happen. The ram which you saw having the two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia. And the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. Now, we have to stop here for a minute because a lot of people, uh, when I first did, did the, the first video on this, had an issue with that. That says Greece. Well, you can never find a, pl a place anywhere where Greece was ever a major power, ever in history. They've always, when they had power, they were part of the Ottoman Empire. So it can't possibly be Greece. There's just, Greece would have to grow big time as a nation. But when you go look at what they referred to in the, in the, Old, Te or in the Old and New Testament, they referred to Jews... And then everyone else outside of Israel was Greek. They were Greeks. Now, when you go into the King James, the actual word being used is Grecia. And that term means Greek territory. So this could be referring to literally any country. Personally, I think it's referring to America, but that's just me. As for the broken horn and the four that stood up in its place, four kingdoms shall rise out of that nation, but not with its power. Did I miss the verse where it says he's the first king? Because there was one in there where they said he was the first king. Oh, there it is right there. I didn't even read it all. Um, the large horn that is between its eyes is the first king. This is an interesting statement. It's, it's a very specific reference. Well, who would be considered a first king? They are, they're calling Trump king. I'm just saying, you know, everywhere else has had a king already except for America. As for the broken horn and the four that stood up in his place, four kingdoms shall rise out of that nation, but not with its power. And this seems to indicate that this nation is going to break apart. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, the fullness of the Gentiles, the fullness of the Greeks, a king shall arise having fierce features who understand sinister schemes. This is the Antichrist. Read the next four verses and you see a clear description of the Antichrist and what he's going to do during the tribulation. So this obviously is a description, a vision of what's going to happen at the end. And they even tell him twice, it's the time for the end. Here and here. For the, the time where the tribulation. And we see that on the, we're on the horizon of that right now. So taking that into account, reading this, this uh, particular set of scriptures and this vision, you first read it, and I did, you get this impression that this grand event is going to happen. Now that I'm looking at the world stage and what's happening, it may not be as grand as what it seems like. And a lot of prophecies are that way. They're actually quite subtle. Um, Revelation chapter 12, when you read the first six, six verses, that's a grand vision. Really big vision. But then you see, most people didn't even see the Revelation 12 sign that came up in 2017. So it can be something very subtle. Much of what happened during with Jesus and the stuff that he did didn't register with them, the Jews, even though they understood the, the prophecies. They were looking for a grand savior to come riding in and he was going to save everybody and take all the power away from everyone else and give it all to the Jews. And that wasn't what happened. It was actually quite subtle. So this is why we've got to pay attention and why we've got to read, 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 because we never know what's going to actually fulfill this. It can be something so insignificant, and we not look at it and see it that way because we're looking for something bigger. It's actually something quite small. Um, now that we've read that, and I'll do another in-depth one in there because I want to show you guys some of the scriptures that show you some of the things I mentioned in here. Now, David Benjamin emailed this to me, and this may be the country, because I think that's America that it's referring to, well, we may be actually seeing the country breaking apart. Now, who the other four leaders are, I don't know. Who the Antichrist is, I've got a very strong suspicion of who that is. Um, and it would work out perfectly 
if he ended up suddenly jumping up in power. And it actually goes along with where he's headed right now anyway. So COVID-19 is not just changing American daily lives. It is also transforming their system of government. And we see that. Our governments are transforming across the board. On many important current issues, the U.S. may end up with an arrangement that looks more like the Articles of Confederation than the Constitution. Do you remember what the Articles of Confederation were? It was chunks of states, chunks of territories together. Consider how this might evolve. First, states and regions are recovering, or not, at dramatically different rates. The worst may be over for much of California and Washington State, but New York City, because of its density and reliance on the subway, may find the problem especially difficult to control. Louisiana is on the verge of catastrophe. It is, because they've still been holding, they've been holding uh, the parties there. Um, while some other states, such as Virginia, are still not sure how bad it will be. <clears throat> Lisa Boyce did a great video today talking about how the death count may actually be a lot lower than what it is. When you dig deeper into the numbers, you find that pretty pretty close to being true. And you find out there may actually be more people infected than, than what they realize. Because some people are asymptomatic. They don't even know they're sick. And they're spreading it everywhere. In this context, COVID-19 is the top political, economic, and social issue. It is not simply about spending tr trillions of dollars or monetizing the debt, which most Americans view as abstract issues. The question is when and how to relax the current lockdowns, and the lockdown is the number one feature of just about everyone's life at the moment, even in states not officially or completely locked down. And that's true even here in Texas. Most people don't care. They're not listening anyway. That's why I've been avoiding everybody. President Donald Trump refer, appears to believe he has the authority, listen closely, to reopen the country, and many do so as soon as next month, and may do so as soon as this month. Whether or not that is wise, the federal government cannot reopen the country on its own. The actual shutdown orders came from governors, and it is governors who will have to lift them, perhaps acting in concert without the federal government. You see what's already happening here? If the federal government says, hey, open everything back up, because they, they're talking about wanting to do it in a couple weeks or less, these states could band together. You could see a breaking apart of the nation right now. These states could band together. What would that do? Dissolve the Great Horn. Dissolve the presidency. Furthermore, they, they don't want Texas to do it because most of the military is here in Texas. Furthermore, objective conditions will have to be sufficiently positive that people will, in fact, respond and head out to stores, restaurants, and other public spaces once again. Now, listen to the time frame here, because they put a time stamp on this. As May begins, and it's about to start, it seems likely, or it's highly likely, that the states will be reopening at their own paces and with their own set of accompanying restrictions, with some places not reopening at all. There is likely to be further divergence at the city and county level with, say, New York City having very different policies and practices than Utica or Rochester upstate. So the state itself is going to break apart. Such divergence in state policy is hardly new, but until now, states have typically had many policies in common on such broad issues as education, law enforcement, and on narrower ones, such as support for Medicaid. Now, and suddenly, on the number one issue by far, the states will radically diverge. He's very clearly describing a breaking apart of our union. Hence the idea that America is inching closer to what it was under the Articles of Confederation, which governed the U.S. from 1781 to 1789. The U.S. constitutional order has not changed in any explicit manner, but the issues on which the states are allowed to diverge has gone from being modest and relatively inconsequential to significant and meaningful, if not dominant, the divergence may create further pressures on federalism. In Rhode Island, for example, state police have sought to stop cars with New York state license plates at the border, hindering or delaying their entrance. Whether such activities are constitutional, most governors do not do have broad authority to invoke far-reaching emergency powers, basically locking down their borders. And you will see bands of states come together to do this. As some states maintain strict lockdowns while others reopen and allow COVID-19 to spread, such border-crossing restrictions could become more common. 
And more important, Maryland has been stricter with pandemic control than was Virginia. So perhaps Maryland will deny or discourage entry from Virginia. In metropolitan Washington, there are only a few bridges crossing the river that divides the two states. Or maybe Delaware won't be so keen to take in so many visitors from New Jersey, while Texas will want to discourage or block migration from Louisiana. Right now, Louisiana's having it hard, but they don't hardly talk about it. It's bad over there. These interstate divergences and divisions would then matter all the more as cross-state migration would be less likely to equalize outcomes. The federal government might try to persuade the states to act differently, or Congress might try to f use federal aid to leverage state-level policy, or it might not. And it's easy to imagine Trump ignoring or even inflaming the issue. So he has someone or some place to attack and blame. And of course, you can see these guys are against Trump, but nevertheless, the details in the story are very eye-opening. The best outcome, and maybe also the best bet, would be for this new federalism to end alongside the reign of panic during the COVID-19. Still, is there not at least a small chance that a federalist compact will be rewritten more permanently? It's already the case that California, Oregon, and Washington State have formed a pact to govern reopening and COVID-19 control. You're already seeing states doing it. They're going to become four little groups. What if states and cities enjoy their newfound autonomy on issues that matter? In that case, the pandemic might succeed in changing the very meaning of the term, the United States. This column does not necessarily reflect the opinion of Bloomberg and its owners. I'm going to link this in the description. You read it again for yourself, but how interesting. David, if you're watching, that was a great catch. Now go back and look at Daniel 8 and look what it talks about in Daniel 8. Notable horn, the first king crumbles, the power of the presidency crumbles, then you have four others that come up in its wake, and then another one comes up out of that. Guys, I think we're seeing that happening. Now, again, when you read Bible prophecy, and I'll do a different video getting deeper into this, when you read Bible prophecy, sometimes it reads like something incredible. Like it's going to be a huge grand event the whole world's going to see. But then you see it actually happen. It's like, wow, that was actually very subtle. And I think we're seeing the fulfillment of Daniel 8 right now. But we'll dig deeper into that later. First, let's go through some of the, more of these stories. The world criticizes Trump for cutting World Health Organization funds. So it's almost like he's putting nails in his own coffin. United States President Donald Trump's decision to temporarily haul funding to the World Health Organization on Tuesday over the or it was yesterday on the organizational response regarding the coronavirus pandemic has triggered a chain of responses worldwide. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez said it was not the time to reduce resources to the WHO. WHO really ain't no good for nothing anyway, but Now is the time for unity and for international community to work together in solidarity to stop this virus and its shattering consequences, he said in a statement. The European Union joined worldwide condemnation of Trump's decision, saying on Wednesday it was unjustified during the coronavirus pandemic. Deeply regret U.S. decision to suspend funding to WHO. There is no reason justifying this move at the moment when their efforts are needed more than ever. French government spokeswoman is uh, she was speaking in a cabinet meeting that decided on a 110 billion euro rescue package. Then Russia condemned Trump for cutting WHO funds. Decision was selfish and hurt a body that many countries were looking to for leadership. Russian Deputy Foreign Minister Wednesday was announcing very alarming. So you see what's happening across the ocean, across the whole earth. See what's happening? They're starting to come against us. Um, this is an example of a very selfish approach by the U.S. authorities to what is happening in the world as regarding as regards the pandemic. Such a blow to this organization at a time when the eyes of the world community are in many ways looking precisely to it is a step worthy of condemnation and censor. China urged the United States on Wednesday to fulfill its obligation to, to who? So, and even Microsoft did too. So, we see them... I'm not going to read every bit of these articles. I'll link them all in the description. So what we're seeing is we're seeing other parts of the world are also condemning what's going on, just like our own country is. We're seeing the notable horn maybe starting to crumble. 
But where does Iran fall into this? UN says not the time as Trump suspends WHO funds over pandemic. Trump said Tuesday that he had instructed his administration to suspend funding to WHO over its handling of the coronavirus pandemic in a move that drew immediate condemnation. He accused the group of promoting China's disinformation about the virus that likely led to a wider outbreak of the virus than otherwise would have occurred. And this is all about the United Nations getting all over them. And here we have, here we have the blame game. This always happens when this kind of stuff pops up. Is you have the big blame game. Global condemnation of Trump's decision to suspend WHO funding during pandemic. Here we have more on the European Union. I'm going to link all these in the description so you guys can read them yourselves. Now, there was a story that had come up a couple of days ago. Trump doesn't have the power to re force the states to reopen, and we see tons of stories about this. Mainly from Cuomo. Andrew Cuomo, Trump just wrong on power to reopen states. He says he doesn't have the power. Get out of here. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo on Tuesday said that President Trump is wrong for claiming the president has the authority to reopen the states. Uh, businesses in states rather than govern, rather than the governors which is basically asserting federal control over the, the states. I don't know what the president is talking about, frankly, Cuomo said it in an appearance on NBC's Today Show. We have a constitution. The constitution is based on a balance of powers. Cuomo cited the Tenth Amendment, which states that powers not delegated to the U.S. by the constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states, respectively, or to the people. The president doesn't have total authority. The constitution is there. The Tenth Amendment is there. A number of cases over the years. It's very clear. States have power by the Tenth Amendment, and the president is just wrong on that point. I'm going to link this one. No. Um, so, clearly, we see a big issue going on right here. Where everybody's getting bent out of shape about what this, uh, of this stuff going on. Namely, as it asserts to our countries, but we see problems starting in other countries. If you go back and reread the first part of Daniel 8 and think about it from this standpoint, not from a war and attack standpoint or, or, or a grand gesture standpoint as far as some Bible prophecies go, this makes so much more sense. And it actually matches even closer to what Daniel 8 is saying. So we could actually be witnessing it happening right, literally right now. Because if, if the states pull together and separate on this, they'll take a governor out of their group of states and they'll make them uh, leadership. Or they'll, the governors will band together and become leadership for that group of states. Becoming a horn. And then one's going to rise up out of it and become the Antichrist. Y'all, If y'all been here any length of time at all, you already know who I think that is. I think that's Kushner. So That's just me personally. So, go read these articles. Um, this particular uh, search criteria, I'll because I'll, I can go up here and do Bing search. I'll put that link in there. That'll take you to this search criteria, and you can read these other stories looking at this stuff. Guys, this is important because when we look at Daniel 8 and we look at what it's referring to, in light of this information and what we're seeing happen, and that first article that David Benjamin sent me, and reading what it says... It sounds like it's speak, literally speaking about that. Because the Articles of Confederation, that's what it was. It was groups, it was territory. Different territories with their own leadership that were involved in that stuff. Which is looks like what we're going back to. So yeah. And again, what happens, what this, this is all, this whole event is associated with the rising of the Antichrist. The tribulation. We're seeing it happen right now. I don't think we're going to be here very much longer, but you know what? The next six months, all this is going to unfold. We're going to see everything in our world change as they try to get things back on track. And we're witnessing it. So again, you know, when you look at Bible prophecy, look at it from the standpoint of what how it reads, which would be literal, then look at what our time frame, what our world, to see those things taking place and how they would take place. And we start to see a very, very interesting picture. 
All right, guys, so that's the headlines I wanted to share with you. Um, I'll dig deeper into that on Daniel and show you the other places where we can see the significance of the referencing uh, to give us a clearer, more clear understanding of how these prophecies unfold. It says that Bible the prophecy isn't subject to private interpretation. You know, it's it, this is there's there's one interpretation of it, and in most cases we don't know it until after it's happened. Uh, but how amazing that we're seeing these things unfold, and it's like, hmm, that seems like it matches. So check out the links, read this stuff, and uh, find and come to your own conclusion on this, and see what you think. Uh, and definitely go read chat Daniel chapter eight. It's pretty. Uh, yeah, pretty eye-opening what we're seeing happen right now. And it's so fast. You can't keep up with it. All right, I'll see you guys in the next one.